I'm a clinician. Uh, my first lipedema patient that I recall was 28 years ago. I just started at the Cleveland Clinic, and I know I'm taking my own time here, but I think it's important to note that. And I, my mentor, who was chair of our department at the time, Jess Young, said, well, that's lipedema. And I said, well, how do we treat that? Well, you can't do anything for it. You can try support hose. And uh, I was a little discouraged. Um, I'm actually an expert in clotting. Uh, my, um, I'm a hematologist. I'm an internist. And uh, I'm in the section of vascular medicine at the Cleveland Clinic. We see swollen legs a lot. So when Margarita and Karen and I were on the phone call with Cheyenne a few months ago, we thought, what could I talk about? And uh, I volunteered to talk about swollen legs because this is what clinicians and you probably started with. You might have started with your family doctor, your internist. Um, or maybe a hematologist, less likely, but whoever it was, um, most likely didn't know what lipedema was. So I have no uh, conflict of interest. So uh, swollen legs are a common problem. In fact, in, uh, although we see a lot of clotting problems at the Cleveland Clinic, our most common consult is about six out of 10 are swollen legs. So it's common to all specialties. There are many different causes. It's really not a disease. It's a sign of an underlying disorder but it may be a minor disorder or a more serious problem. And this is an uh, article published about 30 years ago from Henry Ford Hospital stating that lipedema is not rare, but the diagnosis is rarely made. And I think you all have probably suffered from that. So why is it so difficult to diagnose? Well, when you're a physician in a busy office and you have 15 minutes, now we have 12 to see patients and follow up, or for a first time consult, we might have 45 minutes when we had an hour, hour and a half in the past, and then the patient brings in a, a pile of records, and there are so many different causes of l swollen legs. There's heart failure, there's pulmonary hypertension, there's liver and kidney disease, there's endocrine diseases like Cushing's or pretibial myxedema. You could have obstruction of your vena cava, the major vein that connects the legs to the heart. You could have um, an infection, you could have a blood clot, you could be pregnant, you could be overweight, you could have arterial disease that's so severe that you hang your legs over the side of the bed and they swell. It could be a medication or it could be something like a venous problem. So some of the more uh, common things that we see in our clinic in addition to lipedema is chronic venous insufficiency on, in the middle slide, lymphedema, phlebolymphedema, lipolymphedema, and more recently Steve Dean came up with this term, phlebolipedema, and I'm not sure if you do a Google or if you look in Ovid, which is the medical way I do my uh, research on, um, on articles, I could not come up, um, Karen, with one article on phlebolipedema. Am I right with that? Yeah, so not mentioned often. So again, uh, I'm an internist, hematologist, patient comes in, the legs are swollen, and they may say, gee, my legs are swollen, uh, my shoes are too tight, I might feel stiff, I might be achy, I might have a heaviness, uh, painful legs, uh, or you may have many other complaints that you've uh, mentioned to your doctor. And there are a number of mechanisms that you can have for swollen legs. It could be venous, it could be lymphatic. You could have too much volume if your heart's not working properly. You could have increased capillary permeability, lowered oncotic pressure, or simply obstruction. So uh, a good clinician will start with a history and physical exam. The history, we want to ask, did it suddenly develop or has it been gradual? And if it was sudden, it might be a blood clot, it could be an infection, it could be a muscle tear, it could be gout. But if it's more gradual, it's more likely lymphedema, lipedema, chronic venous insufficiency, a systemic process, and we always have to look at your medications to make sure it's not a medication. So the other questions I will ask, how painful is it? Does it get better overnight when you elevate your legs? Do you have evidence of heart disease, kidney disease, liver disease? Have you had fever or chills or recent weight loss or weight gain? Have you been a long, on a long car trip or airplane trip? Have you been immobilized with the flu three or four days or more? Have you had recent surgery? Are you pregnant? And then what medications are you taking as well? And these pictures all just go over what I've just mentioned. Uh, so um, these are, again, things that the internist, family doctor, or whoever you see, NP, advanced practice nurse, it should be thinking about and asking those questions. Why are your legs swollen? Because you started out going to the doctor not knowing you had lipedema. You went in there not sure, why are my legs swollen? And that's our job to figure this out. And all the medications, look at these, Lyrica, Ibuprofen, Neurontin, Norvasc, 
diabetic medications and tricyclic antidepressants. All of these can cause leg swelling. So a detailed history is very important and looking at all the medications when you are trying to diagnose why is my patient complaining of swollen legs. And the physical exam. If it's unilateral, we go down one pathway. If it's bilateral, we go down another pathway. And then we look at where is the swelling? Is it pitting and is it pitting or non-pitting? Does it involve the foot? Does it just involve, involve the thigh or the calf and no foot? And here are some examples. Now on your left uh, is a tourniquet. You, uh, you can't see the tourniquet, but you see the straight line. And this is a young man that came to us. No one could figure out why his leg was swollen. So I always make my patients get in a robe or a gown, and they don't like it all the time, but I won't go in the room if they're not undressed, because simply, how can you make a diagnosis? I walked in the room, I took a look at this guy's leg, and I knew that he was factitial. He had been applying a tourniquet. He was trying to get more disability and didn't want to go back to work. Now, the one in the middle, and you can see all that swelling in that foot, someone at the nursing home was wrapping that individual's legs. Now, it spared the toes, if you look carefully, but the way it was wrapped, I, I'd never seen anything quite like that, so I have lots of pictures of it. And then on your far right is a great example of pitting edema. So these are the things that we must look at. We look at the color of your legs. Are you red, like cellulitis? Are you brown, like venous insufficiency? Although this one, I'm gonna show you another slide, bigger slide, but it's the only one I could find was due to tetracycline. Um, or is it purple blue and you have an extensive left leg or right leg DVT? We should feel your groins. Do you have lymph nodes that are palpable? We should look at your feet. Do you have tinea pedis? In that right lower corner, you'll see a great example of tinea pedis. In lymphedema, that can be deadly because you can get recurrent bouts of cellulitis. Do you have a stemmer sign, which you, we've already heard about? And we should examine your pulses in your groin, behind your knee, and in your feet. And then there are a whole bunch of blood tests that we can do, and uh, more than I'm just mentioning here, but we want to get a complete blood count. We want to look at your liver, your kidney, your thyroid. We want to do a D-dimer to see if you've had a blood clot. We might want to look at a BNP to see if you have heart failure. We'll look at your urine. Are you spilling protein? And we might get a chest x-ray. We might get an ultrasound of your legs. We might get CAT scans or MRs. We might get an echo or a lymphocinogram. So these are all things that the clinician has available to them. But still, a history and physical is much more important and thinking about the differential diagnosis. So this is an algorithm that I won't go through in any more detail, but about everything I just mentioned, a good history and physical, and then use your lab, but use your clinician, clinical skills. And in the bottom right-hand corner is other. So let's talk about other causes for swollen legs. And I couldn't find a better example of venous insufficiency than this, but again, this is due to tetracycline. But this might be a way a patient with chronic venous insufficiency would present to the physician's office. It's often overlooked and underappreciated. As many as a million uh, or uh, six million people in the U.S. have venous diseases or skin changes. 25 million of us have varicose veins, and many have a venous ulcer. Uh, these ulcers are typical. We can make the diagnosis more easily if you have the ulcer than just the skin changes, but this is a great example of chronic venous insufficiency. It's due physiologically due to ambulatory venous hypertension, and patients will have severe pain at times or mild pain. They might complain of cramping, fatigue, heaviness, itching, or throbbing type pain. And generally, the diagnosis can be made clinically. As you see here, we have all these great examples of venous insufficiency. Again, pitting edema. In the left lower corner is corona flabectatica. I love using that in my patients. I think you have corona flabectatica. And, uh, <laughs> And they kind of look, and I think right away they think, this guy's pretty sharp, knows what he's talking about. And then I just mentioned that it's ankle flaring. That doesn't sound as exciting. So I, I, I love corona flabectatica. And the other one is in the upper right-hand corner, lipodermatosclerosis. Now, that's one you have to practice in the mirror several times before you can get it right. Lipodermatosclerosis is bad venous insufficiency, and the skin gets hard and thick and very painful. And then we have one in the middle, atrophy blanche, which is kind of a form of um, very painful form. So how do we treat that? Well, healthy lifestyle, ideal body weight. If you're overweight, we may consider surgery. Compression garments are very, very important. The key here is that if you have peripheral arterial disease, something called, um, uh, and a test we use in ABI, an ankle brachial indice, 
check the blood pressure in your arm and ankle, and if it's less than 0.5, then you might not benefit from compression, compression therapy because your arteries are bad. But we do good wound scare, uh, skin care, pharmacological therapy. We might try horse chestnut, also known as Venustat, or Trental, also known as pentoxyphylline. Exercise and endovenous, and endovenous innervations may be helping. Now, lymphedema, lymphedema LY, can be unilateral or bilateral. It's an abnormal accumulation of interstitial protein-rich fluid. And I bet you many in this audience, and if I asked for a show of hands, would say, my doctor said I had lymphedema. And uh, vascular surgeons are prone sometimes, I hope there aren't too many of you in the audience, but to make that diagnosis error as well. Lymphedema and lipedema are different, as you well, well, well know. So there are primary and secondary forms. Uh, and the more common ones we see are secondary due to chronic venous insufficiency, infections, surgery, radiation therapy, tumor or trauma. trauma. And uh, the onset can be insidious, like lipedema can be. It can be unilateral or bilateral. It can be painless, however. So lymphedema classically is painless. And as you well know, lipedema is not. Uh, the edema is initially soft and pitting, later becomes fibrotic. You can get a dorsal hump called a buffalo hump. You can uh, have the positive stemmer sign, which we've already heard about. You can get exaggerated skin creases that you see here in this picture, squaring of toes, and sometimes a podio orange late sign indicating uh, long-standing lymphedema. And we can make the diagnosis clinically most of the time, but we can use a test called a lymphocinogram. We sometimes do a duplex to make sure you don't have underlying venous disease. And at times, we'll do a CAT scan or MRI of your abdomen or other areas to look for another cause of such as obstruction. Treatment, meticulous skin care, because individuals with protein-rich fluid are prone to recurrent infections called cellulitis. Physical therapy, manual lymph drainage, compression garments, intermittent pneumatic compression. And then exercise is very important, uh, educating your patients, and then, of course, surgery as well. Now, phlebolymphedema is uh, a little well, uh, more well-publicized. Again, you have, often have coronaflavicatica, more likely in women than men. And um, this is due to chronic venous insufficiency and uh, lymphedema as well. And what happens, the um, lymphatic transport initially is continuing to work in these individuals, but later it becomes overwhelmed, leading to secondary lymphedema. Uh, if you see in the upper right-hand corner the bowling pin, sometimes people refer to this as the bowling pin or the inverted champagne bottle because the leg really becomes tapered. And that slide I showed you on lipodermatosclerosis looks like that. The skin gets very fibrotic. Uh, it's usually unilateral, but can be bilateral. And we do imaging to make the diagnosis with ultrasound. Again, we might use CAT scan or magnetic resonance venography. I have two minutes to go, so I think my slides get cut off at that moment, or I do. Um, and we might use uh, intravascular ultrasound to make sure we're not missing a lesion higher up in the groin. Now, the treatment, treat both the lymphatic and venous systems, ideal body weight, skin care, endovenous uh, uh, interventions, uh, maybe a stent or so in the groin area, or sclerotherapy are also used, and then, of course, compression garments. Lipolymphedema is lipedema that progresses to lymphedema, and I'm getting near the end. It's rare, but we think it's increasing, and it's a result, some say, from fat deposition causing damage to the lymphatics and capillary system. I'm sure Karen may have other ideas about that, but uh, I'll defer to her. Uh, these individuals ha no longer have the foot spared, so you have lymph uh, lipedema, and now you've developed lymphedema. You probably have a stemmer sign if you have this. Lymphocentography may be helpful to show that lymphatic da uh, damage. Again, we would do a duplex to make sure you don't have underlying venous problems, and then we would use the same things that we do for other swollen legs, decongestive therapy, uh, manual lymph drainage type, uh, and uh, compression garments. Now, phlebolipedema, uh, you have hyperpigmentation, as you can see here. And this is venous disease with lipedema. No stemmer sign, but you have the ankle cutoff sign. And I slide again from Steve Dean at Ohio State, um, a, a wonderful physician, the smartest guy I know. Uh, phlebolipolymphedema, this is pseudotumor, massive localized lymphedema, and lipedema and chronic venous insufficiency. So, uh, and, and that one, you could see the um, 
guess I can go back here, um, the discoloration around the ankles. And I think I'm going to end on time. I'll show you this is a differential diagnosis of the swollen legs, of which I've just mentioned. But as I told you, there are many, many other causes. So uh, my role here, or my thoughts, is before you talk to a doctor, choose one trained to listen. Thank you.